So why don't we get back, uh, back, get started back up and then Matthew, Dr. Morlingham is going to be the session chair for the next one. Thank you. All right. I hope everybody enjoy their lunch and it seems like everybody is coming back. So that's great. So we'll continue uh, the talks with three more talks. Spotlight Talks, um, and it's the same format, 15 minutes, 10 minutes presentation, five minutes question. So uh, the first one is from uh, Cheng Gong from Dartmouth. He will present a unified deep learning framework to solve forward and inverse ice sheet modeling problems. You ready? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I will just continue with, with what I have showed uh, just before the lunch. And this will be uh, sort of a little bit more details about what we're doing and how we, uh, how we uh, create this framework and how we train it and then what we're going to use it. Uh, so, so before I go to the machine learning part, I want to give you a crash course of ice sheet modeling in three minutes. Let me try this. Uh, so in ice sheet modeling, uh, the main problem we want to solve is what we call the stress balance equation. Or basically, we want to the problem we want to solve is given a geometry of the ice, what is the flow velocity, the ice velocity? So how, the, how ice flow in the given geometry? And then using this geometry, we can update the, the oh, sorry, using this velocity, we can update the geometry for the next time step. And then we can uh, simulate in the transient run. And so here I give an example, this equation, this is a partial differential equation. It's nonlinear PDE. It comes from the momentum balance or uh, conservation, conservation of momentum. And then <clears throat> it's basically saying that the, the stress is equivalent to the gravitational force. And then what we call the fourth problem, as I mentioned, is given the geometry, given also we need some boundary conditions of the ice, the, the basal condition. And in this case, it's uh, the basal friction coefficient or, or the friction at the base. And then we can solve this partial differential equation and then get the ice velocity. Uh, so that is what we call the, the forward problem. And then, uh, it doesn't work. Okay. okay. So, and then the so-called inverse problem is knowing the ice geometry, knowing the flow velocity, uh, can we infer the basal condition? Because in, in the ice community, usually, the basal condition is not observable. So we need to use some numerical method to try to infer it from observation. And the, the standard way is to, to do this is we call it to solve this adjoint stress balance equation uh, or basically adjoint, adjoint method to infer the basal friction coefficient using geometry and velocity. So these are what we call the forward and the inverse problems. And in this talk, I'm going to show you how we are going to solve both forward and inverse problems using a uh, physics-informed neural network. <clears throat> so that's the, the whole ar architecture of, of the uh, pin of the physics-informed neural network you have seen in, uh, before the launch. Uh, we have uh, a neural net, and the input is the coordinate system. Again, we're learning the variables of or all the states variables given the coordinates of, of the, the domain. Okay, so the input are x, y coordinates and the outputs are velocity, surface, or the geometry, and also the boundary conditions, the basal friction coefficient. And then we can use that to construct our loss functions. So the loss function has two parts. One is from the data, so we have some data misfit, and then the other part is from the physics. 
So the data misfits are from the observations, uh, velocity observations, so basically mis misfit, and then surface elevation. Uh, in this case, I also put uh, friction coefficient here. These are not truly observations, and but we consider those as reference data, so we just call it sort of data or observations. But just keep in mind, we don't have any direct or we, we, we almost have no uh, direct observations of the base of friction coefficient. Uh, so, and then we can use the physics I just showed, the PDEs, um, and then use uh, the output of the neural nets to evaluate the residue of the PDE, and then put the residue as part of the, the loss function. So if we sum, sum up all these terms, uh, and then we can construct a loss function, and then we can train the neural nets by optimizing this loss function, and then get the optimal solution uh, where the output of the neural nets will both satisfy the PDE and also minimize the misfit of, from the observation. But actually, it turns out if uh, we know all the data, for for example, in this case, are the, the five outputs, if we know all the data for these five outputs, and we know the PDE, the whole problem becomes overdetermined. Uh, so we can just pre, pre pretend we don't know something and let the neural nets figure out the missing part using the physics. And in this case, I'm showing if we just pretend we don't know the velocity, and then we just basically remove this term from our loss function, and then train the neural nets using the rest of the data together with the PDE residue. And then it turns out we can recover this part, this hiding or missing data. And now this architecture becomes a, a forward solve because we're solving, we're basically solving the velocity using all the other data. And the same story, if we pretend, or actually we don't know the, as I said, we don't know the friction coefficient. So if we just use all, all the other observations as the data, and then use the same PDE, it's always the same PDE residue, and then train the neural nets, and let the neural nets to figure out what the missing part is. And that becomes our inverse problem or the inverse solve. Okay, and then it turns out with the neural net, with this architecture, we can do more. So what if we just pretend we don't know the eye thickness or the bad topography? And then we just hide that part and then put the rest of the data into the training process, use the same residue and train the neural nets and let the neural nets figure out the well, in this case, well, sorry, this the the type, the caption was wrong, but it's it's a geometry, or I I, I should I should it it should be the ice thickness, not the uh, the surface elevation. Um, but anyway, so if we just pretend we don't know the geometry and then let the neural nets figure out the to solve the geometry, then the the neuro, the pin becomes a solver, a kind of a a novel inverse solver to infer the bad topography using stress balance. Remember the talk I gave in the morning, we're, we're using the mass conservation. And in this case, we're using another type of physics, which is uh, momentum conservation. <clears throat> so now I, I'm going to show you some of the results. Uh, for the fourth problem, as I mentioned, we just hide or just we just provide friction coefficient uh, ice thickness and surface elevation, and then let the neural net to figure out what the the velocity is. And these are the pin predictions, and then you can see the misfit. I would say uh, the pin is really doing a really good job in terms of uh, learning all the all the variables from the data, as well as inferring or solving for the ice velocity using both the data and the physics. Okay, and then. The next one is the inverse problem, the same. We just uh, train the neural nets, the same neural nets, same, same architecture. But in this case, we just provide 
the 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 data without without or we just provide the velocity and geometry data and then let the neural nets figure out what the friction coefficient is and that's the neural nets solution <clears throat> as a, a as an ice modeler i can tell you the neural nets is still doing a good job although you can see there are large arrows on some of the area but these are all the thin ice layer or very thin ice uh, almost not moving area and no matter what friction coefficient you put there it doesn't matter okay uh, and then we can do even more to infer the ice thickness or the bad elevation oh sorry uh, yes the bad elevation so same story uh, we train the neural nets same neural nets but just uh, the difference are what data you provide and then we can get the pin predictions and also you can see the misfit uh, I would say the neural nets is doing a really good job in terms of inferring the ice thickness. Uh, but this is not the whole story because uh, in reality, these are the only data we know or the only, the real observations we have. So we have pretty good observations of the surface velocity from satellite image from, from all the satellites. We have very good observations of surface elevation it's basically altimetry data we have some knowledge or some observations of the ice thickness and these are all the dots i showed in on the on the third sub figure so the the colored dots are the only observational data we have at this region uh, and then the question is, can we just only use these real observational data and let the, the neural nets to figure out the missing part, which is the friction coefficient, and also filling, filling in the gap among the thickness observations? And the answer is yes. So as you can see, the neural nets predictions are pretty close as what you have seen in the previous slides. And the misfits I showed here are for the uh, observed velocity and, and surface elevation. I didn't show the friction coefficient and the thickness. It's because we don't really have real data or observation for that. So it's not really a fair comparison uh, to compare with, uh, with only those dots. So what we do instead is we compare with bad machine. Uh, but keep in mind, bad machine is using mass conservation. And in this approach, we're using stress or uh, momentum conservation. So we're basically using different types of physics. And as you can see, we're getting pretty close results with respect to each other. And again, as, um, as glaciologists, I can tell you for the friction coefficient, uh, the larger arrows, they don't matter. The, these are all the thin layer eyes, slow moving. No matter what friction coefficient you, you put there, you still get pretty good result anyway. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's all about about this product. And uh, in this case, I show you a, a we call it a unified framework. Uh, which I hope I, I, I convince you because we don't change the architecture of the framework. The only difference are what data we provide for the neural nets to train. And then the neural nets can easily or can automatically figure out if it's a forward problem. It was, so basically the neural nets can learn from the data and also uh, try to figure out the missing part using the given physics. Uh, and we're able to do some, some uh, it, some uh, well, we are going to solve some problems which traditional method cannot solve. For example, invert for ice thickness. To our knowledge, this is first time we have ever used stress conservation or momentum conservation, stress balance uh, to solve for to invert for the ice thickness. And also, we can do dual immersion, which basically uh, try to interpolate in between the scattered data and also to infer the unknown variables. Uh, and of course, ongoing work we're currently 
currently working on with Monza is we try to couple both this momentum conservation with mass conservation. So to add both of these two physics into the framework and then try to solve the same problem. Uh, yeah, so that's all about what, what I want to say. Thank you. Is there one good question? Thanks. That was a really great talk. I uh, I think this is a quick question. Have you thought about including time as one of your coordinate variables and thinking about time evolving surface elevation and velocity? I know there's a strong desire to think about how you use that time evolving data set that in the inverse problem framework. And it seems actually kind of straightforward to just add into this. That's a really good question. Actually, we're working on it now. <laughs> so adding time is kind of straightforward next step because you just add T on the left side, on the input side of the neural nets, and then you just provide more data to it. So it will take longer to train. And this is kind of a proof of concept or the first step of using this framework. But of course, adding time and adding more time dependent data is kind of our goal to our, our, our next step. Yes. Cool, thanks. Donna here, Beth has a question. Uh, Donna Beth has a question. You're safe. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit. Um, so your postdoc, uh, true at Dartmouth, your postdoc? Um, research scientist. Research scientist. Okay. How has IHARP and your association with IHARP helped you in your career? Well, that's uh, yeah, that's um, I will I will probably think about it and uh, and answer you later, um, afterwards maybe. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Chang'ong. <laughs>